Today we begin a new series of messages on our problems and the promises of God. Each week of this series, I'm going to talk about one of the great promises of God and then focus on one of the problems that you sent me. This will enable us to utilize the power of the scriptures for our everyday living. Our first scripture reading in this series comes from the sixth chapter of Judges. It's the story of the encounter of the Lord with Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to the Lord's angel, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Let us pray. O oh, gracious Lord, we are like Gideon. We are filled with fears when problems hit. Help us to know how to discover your presence and your power to help us solve the problems of our life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I have a very rough-hewn, outspoken friend. He always says it just as he feels it. We sat down for lunch the other day, and he blurted this out. Lloyd, I've got a great big complaint I want to level. But suddenly I got defensive inside. You know, I thought he was going to criticize me or the church, and I must have shown that on my face because he said, now don't you get defensive. I don't have any quarrel with you. And I said, well, then what's the problem? <laughs> well, he said, problems, that's the problem. You know, I gave my life to Christ. I believe in the Lord. I pray my prayers. I'm a decent man. I do my very best. And still, I've got problems. I think the Almighty doesn't spread his problems around with any quality of... Uh, equality. He just gives them all to me. And he said, as a matter of fact, I think that he's let me down. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt that you've gotten more than you deserved or that the Lord is about to get you down? Everywhere I go, with whomever I speak, I hear it. The same question. It's articulated in different words, and then at times it's uh, expressed uh, not in words at all, but in the expressions on people's faces. It's a real problem. People say, if God really cares, why do I still have problems? Now, I believe that that question is based on three fallacious assumptions. Three distorted thoughts that don't really work. And the first is that there's something inherently wrong with problems. Now, we've been taught over the years that a problem is bad. And so we've gotten to the place where we think about a problem, and when it hits, we say, something must be wrong. We shouldn't have problems. Now, the second thing is that we have all thought that there would come a time when we would be free of problems. I talk to people every day who think of whatever stage they're in uh, as the prelude to a problemless period of their life. You know, if they're in 
college, they think of the time when finally they're going to be able to be free of problems that they have in college. They're going to get onto a job, and in that job, they're going to be free of the problems that they had in college. They get into the job and they say, if I could only get on to the promotion that I want, I'd be free of problems there. They get that job and they say, no, I really got problems. And then they say, oh, I know I can get free of problems if I get married. And then they really do have some problems. <laughs> and then very often people look forward to having children and then during the time that they're raising the children, they think, I know that the best period of our life is going to be when the children move out, get married, and get their own jobs and all, only to find that the problems continue. And I've talked to so many people who are retired who uh, have that uh, funny way of looking at retirement, of saying there's some place where they can get away from it all and have no problems. I talked to a retired person recently who said, listen, if we could only get back to some of the problems that we had when we were in the growing years, now that we're retired, we've really got problems. Well, we think that there's going to come a time when we will be free of all those problems and we won't have to worry about them anymore. But the third thing, built on the first two reasons, is perhaps the most destructive at all. Because we think problems are bad and because we uh, look forward to the time of finally getting free of them all, we begin to wonder, why does God allow them? If he really loves us and cares about us, why does he allow them to happen? Now, you put all of these things together and you come up with a conviction. It's the conviction that if you work hard and clean up your act and do what you're supposed to do and love God and serve him, all the problems are going to be over. As a matter of fact, I meet Christians who are judgmental of other Christians who still have problems saying, oh, if you really love God, you wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> well, I love God and I've got them, and I sense you've got them too. And the question is, what do you do about it? I want to suggest that there is a problem you and I face that is way beyond any other problem that we might suggest. Some time ago, I asked you to write me about all of these problems, and when you did, I got a list in which there are thousands of problems. But I want to tell you that not one of those thousands of problems is your greatest problem. The greatest problem that we all face, the biggest, the fattest, the most momentous problem is this, that we misunderstand problems. Our profound misunderstanding of problems contributes to our inability to handle problems. And that's what I want to talk about. The Lord has so created things that his greatest truth and the deepening of an experience of him and the growth of our relationship in him and the maturing of our personalities through him come all wrapped up in problems. You see, God created us for himself. He gave us freedom and free choice. And you know what we did with it. And the whole sickness and suffering of our fallen creation is as a result of our wrong choices. And yet, the Lord has not given up on us. He intervenes in the midst of it and uses the very problems that we create or are created for us or are the manifestations of the sickness of our society or the mischief of the evil one, and he takes all of them and uses them for his glory. So he takes the worst of the world and uses it to make his best in us and through us. Isn't that exciting? The same God who took the cross, the worst that we could do, and used it as the basis of our eternal salvation, our forgiveness, our assurance, our hope, our peace, our power, is a God who can take the everyday problems of life and through them, deepen us in our relationship with him, help us to grow in the kind of people we were meant to be, move us on to the next stage of our life in him, and get us ready to live forever. Nothing is too big for our God. You see, he's a tough God, a strong God, a God who is able to tackle reality, and he wants to make us like himself. You're not the darling of providence. You're a daughter 
or a child, a son of the Lord. And he wants to make you like himself. And how else can he do it than through the teaching that he does in the midst of problems? There's no other way. What do you do when you want to teach a child how to work out the problems of mathematics? You give them problems to work through so that the verity and the truth is applied in working out the problem, and then it becomes his own. It's the same in the chemistry laboratory, the same in the most complicated of sciences, and most of all, it is true in everyday living. And that's what Gideon discovered. At a terrible time in Israel's history, he accepted some fallacious t thinking. He got all mixed up because of the teaching of his fathers to him. They kept talking about what God had done, bringing the people out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and into the wilderness. And they kept talking about all the miracles. And this sensitive young Israelite began to wonder, well, now, if God did all those great things then, and we're having problems now, it probably means that God isn't with us anymore. And then, in the midst of all the danger, the Lord came to him. He was flaying out the wheat in a wine press down in the valley. Well, why was he there? He was afraid. You don't flay wheat on a wine press. You do it out on a threshing floor, up out in the fields. But he was afraid to be there. And so there he was, down in the valley, flaying out the wheat. Can't you picture him looking around all the time for the Midianites to come? And suddenly he heard the voice of the angel of the Lord. And what the Lord said so contradicted everything he thought about himself and everything he was experiencing in Israel, he was filled with consternation. The angel of the Lord said, Hail, mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. <laughs> Did you him say, man of valor? No, down here in the valley? And God is with us? Well, where are all the miracles if God is with us? No. Why are all these things happening to us? It's our same question. If God cares, why does he allow these things to happen? And then the Lord promised him that he would be with him, that he would help him in the very problems that he was facing, and that he would manifest himself as Lord in Israel. And you know what happened. He brought fire on his sacrifice of his problem, surrendering it to the Lord. He clothed himself with Gideon. Isn't that a marvelous phrase? The translations say that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The real meaning of the Hebrew is that the Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. How would you like the Spirit of the living God to clothe himself with you this next week? He's willing and able. And then meeting Gideon right at the place where he needed him most, Gideon said, but I've got to be sure that you're with me. And so he gave him the fleece test. And did it twice to reassure him that he would be with him. And then he narrowed down his army from 32,000 to 300 to go against the Midianites and the Amalekites who had 135. The Lord wanted to do something so that when it was finished, Gideon would say, the Lord did it. I couldn't have done it with 300 men. Well, what the Lord did for Gideon, he wants to do for you and for me this next week. See, the problems that Israel had had been caused by Israel. They were worshiping another god. They had placed Baal gods in their fields. That's why they were having difficulty. They were syncretizing their gods. They worshiped Baal and Yahweh at the same time. No wonder they were in trouble. And so the Lord told Gideon, get the Baal god out of your own backyard and I'll bless you and all of Israel. And that's the way he does it. The very problems that Israel had, they'd brought on themselves. The Lord didn't send them. And usually the Lord doesn't have to send us any problems. There are enough to go around already, and as I'm sure you understand and know from your own personal life. But he says, I'm with you in it, and together we are going to solve them. Another time that someone accused the Lord of not being present was when Mary and Martha lost their brother Lazarus. You remember, Jesus came four days late, and Mary, uh, with kind of a cranky tone, You've got to read Scripture in depth, you know, and understand what was really happening. <laughs> she said, Lord, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus said, wait a minute. I'm the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You see, out of a problem came a promise. Not only is God with us, but he can do something about what happens to us. He can take the raw material of our problems and raise us out of the doldrums and use those very problems to help us to grow. Don't you see? Problems define the demarcation line of our battle with the enemy. The Lord, who is creator, is also the continuing creator. And when he gets ready to do something about what's wrong in the world, in us, in our relationships, in the church, in society, he raises up his solution hidden in a problem. And if we confront that, face it honestly, and depend on him, he gives us wisdom and knowledge and faith and daring to be able to attempt what we couldn't do by ourselves. So what do you do when a problem hits? First of all, don't focus on the problem. Look to the Lord. When I get a problem, my first tendency is to look to the problem too soon, and I get all involved in uh, muddling in the problem. Now I try and discipline myself that the first thing I do is turn to God. Now the second thing to do when a problem hits is to thank the Lord for it. Thank the Lord for a problem, you say? Yes. Thanking the Lord is the ultimate level of surrender. You get rid of a thing only when you thank God for it. When you can say, Lord, you have counted me worthy of being a co-creator with you and you're going to do something in me that I could never do by myself. Thank you for this problem. I have a friend who just went through a 30-day experiment of thanking God every day for 30 days. Well, that's in keeping with Keats's deepest thought about the fact that no truth is real until it's experienced. Uh, call the world, if you will, he said, the veil of soul-making. And it's true, the word character in Greek is really the word for experience. Character becomes ours when the beliefs that we've held for a long time are applied in a down-to-earth, real-life problem. And so I say, if you don't have any problems, get down on your knees and ask God for a few. Because without them, you probably stopped living. And if you haven't died physically yet, it's coming soon. So the question is, have you praised him for it? Have you thanked him? After you've done that, then it's time to unwrap the problem. Take it all apart. Pull it apart until you understand everything in it. And then, when that understanding comes, you can ask that strategic question, Lord, what are you trying to do in me and through me and in my relationships and in my church and in my society through this problem? I'm ready. And then, the next step is to claim that if you've given your life to Christ, he has come to live in you. Do you realize what that means? The Logos, the eternal Logos, the creator, the one through whom all things were made, has come to live in you. And therefore, the same wisdom, the knowledge, the deep insight into the complex web of things has been given to you and to me. He lives in us, and it's in a problem that what God has put in is worked out. So thank him that he has already given you everything you need. And it isn't that you leave the problem and run to him to find out what you're to do. It's to allow him from within to give you what he has already placed in you. We are the Lord's. He lives in us. And because of that, we can be our own best friend. When you hit a problem, you need all the help you can get. And the last thing you need is to be against yourself. You really need to be for yourself as the leader of your own cheering section. And what would a good friend do for you at a time of a problem? He'd help you understand it, give it to God, and then he'd cheer every effort that you'd make to solve that problem. Do the same thing for yourself. Get outside yourself and say, go to it, Lloyd. You can do it. Have you done that for yourself? Name your own name and dare it. And then know that the Lord is going to do a miracle 
that is beyond anything you could accomplish by yourself. And the last thing to do when a problem hits is to say, Lord, as soon as we get done with this one, send the next one.